Okay, um, good afternoon and thank you to everyone for joining us today for this conversation on making space to write. I am Donna Hemans, the owner of the DC Writers Room, which is based in the Tenley Town area of DC. And in addition to operating the um, DC Writers Room, I'm a fiction writer with two novels, River Woman and Tea by the Sea. So I too am looking forward to this conversation on making space to write. I have with me today three members of the DC Writers Room, Christine Evans, Judith Warner, and Colin Ronig. And I'll briefly introduce um, all three. Uh, Christine Evans writes plays, novels, and opera libretti. Her play, Trojan Barbie, was published by Samuel French, both here and in the UK. And her recent honors include a 2020 Howard Foundation Award, three McDowell Fellowships, and four DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Fellowships. Her novel in verse, Cloudless, was published in 2015. And her recent and current projects include the Russian-American play Festival, Flash Acts, the libretto for Three Marys, a contemporary chamber opera composed by Andre Greenwell, and the novel Nadia, about a refugee from Sarajevo in 1990s London. Christine holds an MFA and PhD from Brown University, served as the Briggs Copeland Lecturer on English at Harvard from 2007 to 2012, and is an Associate Professor of Performing Arts at Georgetown University. And Judith Warner, um, her latest book is And Then They Stop Talking to Me, Making Sense of Middle School. Uh, she's best known for her 2005 New York Times bestseller, Perfect Madness, Motherhood in the Age of Anxiety, and the New York Times column, Domestic Disturbances. She recently co-authored the new campaign playbook, Bold Ideas for Running, Winning, and Transforming America. And she's currently completing a journalism fellowship for the Women Donors Network's Reflective Democracy Campaign. Her last book, We've Got Issues, Children and Parents in the Age of Medication, won multiple awards from mental health advocacy and education organizations, including the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And our third speaker is Colin Ronig. Um, he graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 2007 with a degree in ocean engineering and he served for eight years in the Navy as a Naval Flight Officer. He's a veteran with an MFA from Colorado State University and a writer based in the DC area. So thanks to each of you for being with us here today. So um, first, I want to ask you to um, give a brief description of a project that you are working on or something that you completed at the Writer's Room. And also just give us a short snippet, um, a short reading from that work. Uh, so Judith, let's start with you. Well, thank you so much for including me in this great conversation and for the kind of introduction. Um, I'm going to read from my most recent book, which I completely wrote at the writer's room and wrote the proposal for too, which took a while. Um, uh, and then they stopped talking to me, making sense of middle school. I'm gonna uh, read from the very end of the introduction. Um, I think it, it sums up what I'm doing and just gives a sense of the sound of it. Um, middle school should come with a trigger warning for parents. We all know it can be a psychologically treacherous time for kids. It's the point when old friendships abruptly end, new alliances form, and everyone is subjected to a brutal process of quote unquote sorting as I once heard the psychologist and author Michael Thompson say, which arranges kids into unforgiving hierarchies based on looks, wealth, athleticism, and that ever mysterious ingredient that in my day was called cool. A sixth grade teacher I interviewed for this book referred to it as social power, that indefinable charisma thing. And a middle school dad who normally had an easy way with words struggled to capture it, finally settling on a strange agency. We all want to shepherd our kids through this phase of life with as little emotional damage as possible. What we don't realize, though, is how at risk we ourselves are of being knocked off course by the overwhelming power of our own worry and concern. The author, Brene Brown, has described the parental experience of witnessing and identifying with a child's social travails as a secondary trauma. It's strong language that is probably not an exaggeration particularly for today's parents who have long demonstrated a certain vulnerability to taking on their children's experiences and emotions. They've shown a tendency toward enmeshment, whether through co-sleeping in the family bed or co-watching TV 
or co-celebrating on high school prom night or co-contesting bad grades in college. But there is something about middle school that has a unique power to collapse the boundaries between past and present, parent and child. For a variety of reasons, the middle school age is the time when we feel our feelings most deeply and encode our most enduring memories. It is in many respects, the point at which we first engage with the world in the ways that will continue to work or not work for us in adulthood. It's when we first activate something like the brain power that will fuel our adult perceptions. When we start to construct the narrative identity through which we will describe ourselves to ourselves and to others for the rest of our lives. In other words, it is the time when we begin to become ourselves. Stop there. Great. Um, Colin, how about you next? Uh, sure, yeah. I'm working on um, revising and editing what I hope to be my, my debut novel. I'm hoping to send it to an agent within a couple of months. Um, working title is called Ready Room. And, and the basic synopsis is, um, it's, I guess, somewhat semi-autobiographical in the sense that it, it's based on the plane that I flew in the Navy, which um, communicates uh, the nuclear triad to each other. And the synopsis is that the protagonist um, has the job that I had, and he will eventually have to make a decision whether or not to relay a real nuclear message. Uh, but the story is really about, is it a character literary journey um, following the path leading up to that decision? And this excerpt is, uh, I wrote entirely in the, in the writer's room and it's a flashback uh, where um, it's the night after he first met the woman who will um, eventually be his, his wife. No longer instilled with liquid courage, the caffeine creeped through his veins that ushered in an anxiety that felt strange to him. He was doing so well the night before, or at least he felt he was. At least then they were having a conversation. Now he was letting Natalie do the talking. He needed to talk more. He wasn't talking enough. She realized he wasn't talking enough and would reject him. He knew he needed to talk more, but he wasn't. As they walked back to, to the waterfront and into the sun, the silence between them was an irreconcilable gap that John would never be able to bridge. He had lived inside his bubble for a reason. It was noble that he had stepped outside of it, but it was clear this wasn't a sustainable environment. He had failed Natalie. He had failed himself. When they reached the Kennedy Center, they turned around or walking back into the sun. By the time they reached where they had started, although just 1600, the sun was low enough that it impeded both their view enough for both of them to hold their hands to their eyes. For John, at least it was painful. Before they went back under the shade of the elevated road, they stopped to face each other so that neither of them were facing the sun and was only present in both of their peripherals. So Natalie said, flapping her arms out, how was it? John could feel the sun against the side of his face. He thought of the void he stared into at the beginning of every race, the one that wouldn't go away. The sun was the opposite of that void but it could function the same. It was a star that he couldn't look at directly. It was a living fire. And John was a tinder that was threatening to burn out. His only way to, sur to survive would be to hide. Before John knew what was happening, he felt the strangeness of tears in his eyes. He turned away from Natalie. Natalie touched his back. Whoa, hey, she said. Sorry, John said. He turned from her. John could feel Natalie standing in front of him. What is it, he asked. She asked. He wouldn't look at her. He looked away from the sun and away from her and tried to harden himself, which only made more tears flow. I don't know, John managed to say. He brought his hands down from his face, but he still wouldn't look at her. John felt Natalie's arms wrap around him and, help, and hold him, held him there. Her head lay sideways so that her ear was against his heart. John hugged her back. He put his head on top of hers. They st both stood there and held each other. After a while, John felt a calm come over him. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, and Christine? Okay, so um, right now I'm, I'm working on a novel and um, it's speculative fiction. So I'm kind of wandering around in this new, completely new landscape for me. Um, but I'm not gonna read from that today because I, it's still trying to set like jelly. 
So um, I'm going to read from my novel in verse Cloudless, which is set in Perth, Western Australia. And I was writing this, I think, pretty much at the time that I began overlapping with the Writers Centre. So a little bit of context. Um, this is a story about a swimming pool in Perth, an urban swimming pool that's right across the road from what we call in Australia a women's refuge, but I believe here is called a shelter. So when you hear refuge, think shelter for women who are escaping domestic violence. Um, and you'll understand the characters as we go. I just need to tell you that Auntie is an Indigenous woman and most of the other, and Daryl is an Indigenous kid and the others are white. So I think, I think that's all you need to know. They just, Penny, who is a worker at the refuge, is going out of her mind and decides she's going to take the kids over the road to the pool to see if they can stop bouncing off the walls at the refuge. So here we go. Sorry, but the pool is full, the Russian woman says. Her face, a pitted moon with painted brows, topped off by scarlet hair, sprayed solid in an updo. From her tiny glass shell office, she guards the turnstile to the kingdom, glimmering half deserted past her shoulder, the way a prison guard patrols a border. Penny, Daryl, little Gracie, Kylie and the redhead twins are lining up with Auntie and Jerome to swim with sticky clumps of 10 cent pieces clutched in hand and three frayed towels to share. The kids are frantic with excitement. Daryl's doing skate loops around the lobby, echoes crashing off the tiles and glass. It looks half empty, Penny says. The woman lifts a bird's wing eyebrow, looks too slowly up and down the line of ragtag kids who range in hue from blue black Daryl to the redhead twins that share a volume setting, even when they're quiet, a brain befuddling kind of thrum. They radiate a jangling chaos far beyond the powers of normal kids. Refuge kids, her chilly look says, stares through Penny with a deadpan cold disdain, no deal. Penny's caught off guard, she turns, but Auntie's suddenly in front. Auntie's pretty much immune to scorn. She knows that look. It slides right past like summer flies that never stop their buzzing, always in the background, like the footy on a match day turned down low. Just a form of human weather that gets ugly now and then. So Auntie puts her face into the booth and says, real quiet, be nice if they could have a swim. Don't want the kids to get upset. Daryl sees the standoff, doesn't have to hear to read the cue. He howls and skate walks off the wall, bouncing into Grace who screams and hits a twin who wallops Kylie who in turn spits in his face till Auntie turns and bellows, stop. An angel's quiet grips the children. They all line up in seconds, staring towards the pool with fierce intent. The ticket woman blinks, surveys the scene, Fleet Foot Daryl, followed by Jerome on stumpy legs, the twins, the warring girls now joined in greater cause. And rattled by the sudden quiet, she clicks the turnstile open and the refuge kids rush in, trailed by Penny, still confused by what just happened, then by Auntie, who allows herself a private grin. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was it was great to hear, you know, like such, um, you know, distinct and different um, pieces coming out of, you know, like, you know, distinct and different writers. Um, so I, you know, I know I've heard, um, Judith, I've heard you talk about some of the conversations that you had with writers, you know, like other members at the Writers' Center when you're working on your latest book. So can you talk a little bit about what that means for you and what working at a place like the Writer Center or any kind of co-working space means for your writing? It really was the fact of getting, oddly, I was going to say outside of my own head, even though, of course, we go to the writer's room in order to be able to stay inside our own heads in company. And there's something just very calming about that for me. There always has been to be able to be in silence with other people as opposed to just in my own space at home where all kinds of worries and concerns and anxiety kind of 
encroach upon me. I mean, every, I always feel like at home, every object is calling out to me in some way, telling me of something that I haven't done or haven't done well, or, you know, is waiting for me. Um, whereas being in the writer's room is like being at a library. It's kind of a blank space and you kind of have the buzz of other people around so that you're not lonely, but you, you know, you're in a common enterprise and that has made a big difference for me. And when I have spoken to people, um, people are just really kind, really friendly. It's been a real, well, refuge from the usual competitive environment of DC, especially I felt that a great deal when I, in past years when my children were younger and, you know, it was a refuge from the world of parents at school. <coughs> so, excuse me, go to someone else, I'll come back. Oh, sure. Okay, how about, um, Colin, I know you are a relatively recent uh, member. How, how has working in a space like the Writer Center, how has it um, helped your work? What is it that you, you hope to get? Um, yeah, it's been really invaluable. I, I started working on this novel two years ago and was kind of hopping around from cafe to cafe and looking for libraries to go to and, and none were really giving me the space that I wanted to. And, going to the writer's room, I call it going into my cave. And it was both, um, uh, you know, Judith articulated so many things very well that um, uh, I wish I had said first, but uh, <laughs> I, th I found it both uh, calming and invigorating at the same time, because sometimes I could get, I could get so distracted when I'm trying to write at, at home and I get, can get very distracted very easily. I would go into the writer's room, have, sometimes be there by myself on the weekend. Um, sometimes it would be in the middle of a Saturday, maybe everyone's out and I would have no internet and I would just be there with my thoughts. And that was very calming, but then also I could take kind of my anxious energy and channel it all into one place and channel into my writing. Um, and I, yeah, I think the best part of this novel um, was is the section that I wrote in in that in the writer center? Um, I wrote some other sections there there too, but uh, it just really allowed me, I think, to to just really channel instead of my energy going in like disparate uh, places or or just disappearing to be able to take that energy and to channel it. Um, that's what I found the writer center really allowed me, and also just and then meeting people in the break room, running into people knowing that um, other people are, are working on the same thing and we're all kind of working towards a common goal. I think that that helped me as well, um, coming straight from my MFA to, to DC, um, kind of leaving that community. It was, it was really nice to see that, oh, there are people who are at the MFA, there are people who are a lot younger than me. And now it's like, oh, there's people who are my age, people who have been doing this a lot longer and who are still doing it and I, that's very motivating too. Okay, okay. Um, Judith do you want to finish? Well Colin put things so well he said a lot of what um, what I was thinking and might have said. I like the, the setup of the space so much again because it's sort of you know the common room is quiet peaceful and and you there are no distractions and yet there is this communal room where you can go and talk to people and have coffee and you know with another space to be able to do phone calls if you need to and that's been just such a great um setup for being able to kind of take breaks without having to be too dis dislocated from everything mm -hmm. um and another way in which it was really a respite from dc is that dc is very homogenous in terms of the kind of green types of the people who tend to be here you know my my husband always used to describe it as like a city of class presidents and if you're if you're a writer you are different frankly from you know you're sort of temperamentally different from the mainstream and um i loved being able to go to a place where i wasn't weird where i wasn't a weirdo you know where people like everybody was kind of like this and where also, I didn't have to apologize for not speaking. You know, when I first got to DC, I used to work in politics and prose. There was no writer's room. And after a while, I, I knew a lot of people here. So they would come in. And if you were absorbed in your work, 
you know, it was just a sort of social thing, you know, you weren't supposed to be, you were supposed to be friendly. So to be in a place where, you know, there's a space for being friendly and a space where that pressure is not on you and it's not expected. And to be around, you know, like-minded people who care about language and words and literature. And um, that's a wonderful thing, you know, and it's exciting to be around people who are doing work that's very different from mine. I mean, it's awe-inspiring, you know, listening to the two of you writing fiction, which is what I've always wanted to do. Um, you know, Christine, the idea of, a, 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 you know, a novel in verse is amazing. And, and there's, you know, um, Carolyn Parkhurst watching her and listening to her process, you know, as she would get started with a book. It's just, it's, it's amazing to me to see people's creative process and have, and watch how it unfolds in ways that are kind of mysterious to me. That's a privilege to be able to see that. Right, lovely. Um, and so, Christine, um, you're both a playwright and a fiction writer. And, um, you know, so I imagine that the way you work in a space like the writer's room is going to be different from the way the rest of us work. So can you tell us what it is like for you? How, how do you use the space? Oh, I, I actually feel very, um, I feel very inspired by what, what Judith and Colin both said. And it's almost hard to add to that because for me it's also very much about you know what Judith said so beautifully about this um the silent the kind of parallel play that we do um and I don't think playwriting and fiction are really as different as I imagined they would be once I started on fiction in fact I was sort of really surprised to find that fiction writers talk about scenes as well you know and um internal drama and all, all these sort of things so I've loved making that switch and I feel as though the writer's room is a sort of writerly space. I love looking at the books, you know, I love looking at people's books and, um, and Donna, I'm really so grateful to you for holding this space and for coming in as the owner and making it really beautiful, you know, the, just the paintings on the wall, the calm of the space. I feel like your energy is very much in the space and it's wonderful that you're a writer yourself leading a writer's room you know it feels like a a sort of band of different equals and I love that um and I was chuckling to myself a bit about Judith's remark about the um the DC people that the mindset because it's true that it's really an oasis for that you know I think you know we probably all feel that it's an oasis. I think the only thing I have to say that's different or that can add to the others is that I feel like it's almost like a form of secular prayer to go there, that it's an act of faith that this weird thing that we're pulling out of the air can come into being and everyone is trying to do that and that's really encouraging. It's like, you know, Signing up to be a member is like saying, I believe in myself as a writer. I'm backing my work. I'm backing myself. And all these other people are here, you know, in humble struggle with their own uh, pages as well. So it's just great. And I hope, I hope it stays forever. <laughs> okay. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, so, of course, um, you know, last year um, was, you know, just a very difficult year for everybody all around. Um, but I think, you know, especially for um, writers like you who rely on working on a space outside of your home. So what was it like? How did you manage to create space to work? Or, um, or were you writing at all over the last year? Um, let's start with you, Colin. Um, yeah, it was, it was difficult for sure. Um, actually, I mixed it up a little bit. I wrote, wrote a screenplay last fall uh, for this veterans contest that fact, actor Adam Driver runs this nonprofit. They put on a contest and, and um, I really love film. So I, um, it, it's not very good or at least not <laughs> uh, at first time doing it, but I, I think that was nice. That helped mix it up. Um, uh, and I had to decide to put down the novel, but I think coming and then, so that helped to mix it up in terms of being able to, stay focused because it was so fresh and, and continue to do work. And then um, I picked up the novel still just locked in my apartment. 
and eventually was able to keep the ball rolling until I finally realized like I need to go back into the writer's center. So, um, yeah, I think I just, just found a way to, uh, for the novel, I knew that I wanted to get it done. So that was the motivator, even if it wasn't, um, happening very efficiently, it was, it was happening. And, um, yeah, it wasn't, uh, wasn't necessarily easy though. <laughs> How about you, Judith? Were you working at all? Most of the most of the period of the pandemic was actually very productive for me. I I, um, I have an office in my attic, which is where I am now. You can see the slope of the ceiling. So I have the space. I, I actually cleaned it up. It had become such a mess that I was sort of crowded out of it by mess everywhere. And there actually you can't see, fortunately it's now contained so that it doesn't show up on Zoom, but, um, but I made it usable again. And, and so I was able to be pretty productive until recently where I, you know, and I think a lot of people had this feeling um, with being, you know, being at home that, for, you know, it went through phases of tolerability and then people would have kind of these moments where it became intolerable to them. And um, I have found it that way lately. So I've been a lot, less productive and um i really am so looking forward to the fall and things starting up again and being back in something more like normal life again with all of it you know one thing about this period is that well from the start it made me experience gratitude in a way i hadn't before simply for things like health you know i mean things that 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 i think often we can take for granted but even now it, it, the small details of life I didn't even realize that I missed them until we started looking for them again, you know, or being able to do them again. So being able to, to go and get a coffee in some sort of normal way or see people's faces um, out on the street. And so I'm just looking forward to it. It's, it's almost going to be like a vacation to go back to work at the writer's room um, and be able to walk over to Whole Foods um, and just have those kind of normal rhythms again, I think will be great. Right, yeah, I certainly see that and I, I feel it, I can see it, you know, it's getting back to that place. And how about you, Christine? How did you, um, you know, like make a space to write or were you writing? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I think everyone's circumstances sort of fractured so much during this pandemic. And I just, I really wanna give a shout out to the parents who struggled through this somehow. Um, my husband and I don't have kids at home and we both have a space to work. So those things were just such advantages. Um, having said that, I was on research leave from my university and I really got very uh, blah during the winter in particular because those opportunities come rarely and I couldn't go anywhere. You know, I couldn't even go to a cafe. I just could walk around the block and come back home and we were both home all the time. Um, my husband was working his day job and I, I was on research leave where I would normally be traveling for projects and I was just at home. So I found it very hard at first to write anything. Um, but I think in a way that was productive in its own way because I really thought that I, I really needed time to think about why I write and what I wanted to write, you know. And I, I mean, the feeling that I had was just that the tide had gone out and I had to sit there and think and wait to be refilled. And, and I did come to a couple of simple ideas from that. And one was that the question, what brings me joy, that that's really got to be my compass about anything I write, you know. I'm done proving myself. I'm done with chasing cars for approval or trying to you know write things to impress other people I am going to write what brings me joy even if it's terrifying and um and the other thing is I just thought about people and I thought who are my people who do I want to be around and how can that happen organically and to do with the art so that it was a lot of like floundering around in the mud to come to those very simple decisions and thoughts and then having said that, I did write a couple of short commission plays that brought me a lot of joy because they were produced and performed online. 
Um, and I started, I got going on my speculative fiction novel, you know. Right. So now I, you know, when the sun came back in March, my energy started coming back too. And when we got vaccines, I just felt like it was night and day, you know, this huge cloud of fear and trappedness helped roll off my back. Um, it hasn't helped that I can't go to Australia and that I can't see my family and that I have no way of knowing when I'll be able to do that. It may be another year. Um, but yeah, so a kind of V curve and recovery, I'd say for me. Right. Okay, so you would say then that your writing has changed? Um, yeah. What you write about and how you write? Yeah, I really would because, you know, I had this, this funny little idea come to me in the middle of the night one night when I was like you know awake with anxiety that horrible 4am thing and I just had this little vision and this little phrase come into my mind and I started writing from that and I'm in this other world and it's very science fictiony and it's it feels like it's coming from a more childish younger part of myself and I was very critical of that and like this isn't very sophisticated and blah 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 and then I started doing this writing course with Catapult and I'm just loving it so much and I'm and I'm letting myself just write this thing and have fun with it. So it has, yeah, it has changed and it's mostly about giving myself permission to do that. Right. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, how about you, Juliet? Have you found that your writing has changed? Um, either when you write, how you write, what you write about? Well, the great joy for me was finding that I could write again. I had a terrible, terrible period um, with this last book where I developed, it went beyond a writing block. I, um, I, I had a, a period in which I was literally unable to write. And um, I just researched compulsively, rewrote compulsively, and it was terrible. And um, fortunately, at a certain point, I got past it and started being able to write again. And then you know, it, it was difficult, but at a certain point it started to flow again. And that was just, I mean, talk about being grateful for something you took for granted before. So the simple fact that I got through a lot of projects, I wrote a lot of articles and was able to do it was, was pretty fantastic. It wasn't, it wasn't book stuff. It really was, you know, articles or writing this campaign guide for a, a small nonprofit. Um, and I think, you know, Christine, I think maybe my current version, at least, of this revelation about where I want to write from, this horrible period we just went through in this country, you know, has left me feeling all the more that I want to do work that tries to guarantee that we don't ever go back there again. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's different. You know, as a journalist, you you very frequently don't get to do things that sort of add to the sum total of good in the world. And at this point in my life, if I can put, you know, my skills to that purpose, I, I would like to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I love this idea that, you know, you come out changed um, and, yes. you know, we really did go through quite a bit. Um, so how about you, um, Colin? Have you has your writing changed any? I know you you've tried or you worked on a screenplay, but is there anything else that you would say you're doing differently or want to do differently? Uh, since since joining the Writers Center. Well, either since, either that or COVID. COVID, yeah, either one. Um, yeah, I, I I think that the act of of finishing my novel, I think is a big step for me, regardless of, of what happens with it. Obviously I'd love um, for it to be published and that's the, the next step I'm going to take. Hopefully they, they take it with me. Um, and I do think that's been really big for me. I, I think to take this, that step from thinking of myself as someone who's, uh, Maybe, maybe writing a story in a workshop or maybe it's just a bunch of words put together and, and to take that next step into thinking of myself as um, a real writer, uh, whatever that means, um, or just from, from being an amateur to being a professional. And hopefully the quality of my writing has 
uh, also follow suit. I it can't account for that necessarily, but I think that's been really big, which is actually finishing that project. And um, yeah, I think I spent a lot of time figuring out what it meant to be a writer um, in the Navy, doing engineering, doing writing on the side and, and thinking I'm just this weirdo and, and I think going in grad school and, and, and um, uh, being kind of blown away by the talent around me to out of grad school, what am I gonna do? And kind of just more or less for a little bit before settling into to finishing this novel. So I, I think regardless of whether it's good or bad or published or not, I think it's helped to solidify for me that um, this is definitely not only a part of who I am, but who I am. And that I've, I've made these choices time and time again to, to write and continue to write and build a life around myself to write. And that, yeah, that I am a writer. I think that's what it solidified for me. Okay. Um, so I know there is, um, you know, one of the questions that I often get, you know, from people is, you know, it's, a, it's about the physical space, where I write, what do I have around me, what, what, you know, what inspires me. So can you talk a little bit about that? Um, does the physical space matter to you as much as what the, um, you know, is it, is it the aesthetics? What, what are you looking for? What do you need to have around you to help you to write what inspires you? And Judith, I know you talked about cleaning your office. Um, you know, can you tell a little bit about what that piece of the process is like? It's, it's funny because people are so different with that in terms of what they need and what the aesthetic is and what they consider comfortable or not. For me, being in a space that isn't cluttered, which is undoubtedly a reflection of the fact that my house is very cluttered, being in a place that's just sort of, you know, a, really a blank, slate is so important for me because it allows I guess it just gives sort of room for my imagination to be unencumbered for me to be able to think straight um and it's what I need to get away from you know in getting in getting out of the house and so I love frankly the, the simplicity of the writer's room you know and yet at the same time with the with the paintings and the decoration and, you know, the artwork sometimes by, by one of the members, which is beautiful, um, and people's books, you know, there's just enough of a personal touch to feel the presence of and the talent of the other people. And yet it, again, it, it removes me from myself and my own head, you know, be around, to be sensing what others are doing. So I love the way it is. I love the way it's set up. I know that some people, you know, prefer a space that's like, I don't know, couches everywhere and is more living room like, that would not work for me at all. I mean, that's precisely what I have to get away from. I want something as close in a sense to a library, you know, as possible, except that you get to have your coffee with you and you don't have to worry about leaving your laptop unattended, you know, the way um, you do in a library. So I love the fact that there are big windows, you know, that there's plenty of sunlight coming in that way um it just works for me right okay and christine how about you does the um physical space matter for you when you're writing does it inspire you any at all it does matter but it matters less than i think it does <laughs> you know um if i'm scratching around and trying to get into something i will fixate on anything that is around me as a problem you know so um but really i mean pretty much as judith was saying a library with coffee is pretty close to heaven um, <laughs> i i can do things at home but i much prefer to be to have that separate space and the quietness of the space and to not be entangled in the the wool of my own brain as you know represented by the mess in my house um, and I do kind of like changing spaces when I print out, you know, I like being in one space and then I like printing out and going to sit in a cafe to read through. Mm. Um, I don't know why there's something about just, well, I've got this now, 
I'm going to go somewhere else and sit there with a pen and reward myself with a coffee for the fact that I actually have pages to print out and then kind of come back. So, yeah, those things. And, you know, I've got my superstitious special things. I'll show you one of them. Um, this is a Tiwi bird from um, the Tiwi uh, Islands, um, okay. north of Australia, and my, sis my sister gave it to me. And this bird keeps watch out the window so that I don't have to. Oh, that's nice. I think we all need one of those. I think yeah. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Um, so I know um, community is one of those things that I guess a lot of people talk about when they, um, you know, like join, you know, any kind of um, space or when they move into a new area, um, you know, you, they feel like they need to build a community of writers or like-minded people. So what does community look like for you? And, um, have you managed to build your own community here in the DC area? Um, Colin, I know you, you are, um, you know, having come out of, recently come out of a um, creative writing program. Has that worked for you here? And is that important to you as a, as a writer? Uh, it is, yeah. I, I think um, it took me a while and I'm probably still figuring out like what it means to be a community of writers. And I came from, active duty military, which is not only a very different demographics, but a very different sense of community. Um, sometimes good, sometimes toxic, sometimes like suffocating, um, but close, very close. And then I go to the MFA and I'm like expecting that. And like, we should all be friends, you know? And um, just like, I, I don't know. Uh, and was adjusting to what it means to be a community of writers and and, and trying to figure out that balance between independence and uh, being friends with people. Because there's a lot of, uh, I think that can be a struggle for me. Uh, how much of this do I need to do on my own? And how much of it is something I'm going to ask um, advice for someone or ask them to read? And, and that's and that's something, particularly with writing, because it's um, I have to do it by myself, um, but also, you know, humans are social creatures and it is very helpful to have people read my work. Um, so I did, when I first showed up, I went to a lot of the interloop readings. I don't know if you've been to those. Um, I think they might still be virtual, but going in person, that, that was pretty cool. Um, and, and then I'm starting to realize over time that in terms of uh, the difference between our writer writing acquaintances are, are very important to know but the kind of writer that you're going to be close enough to share work with each other um, that's that's not really something that can be forced and it can't really be transactional either that uh it, it does have to kind of grow organically and that is difficult uh, but i am lucky that i have a couple writers and, and even some some military writers too um, where I've been able to establish that relationship and, and have a community that, that's, that's virtual, uh, that we're sending work to each other electronically, but still having that connection is, is incredibly important. So, yeah. And how about you, um, Christine? Is, that, is community important to you or more important to you um, either as a fiction, from the fiction portion of your life or the playwriting portion, or does it not matter at all? Yeah, um, community is very important. Um, I, I kind of, I love the community that the writer's room gives in the sense that it's like, it's like a little crustaceans each scuttling around in our own shells and occasionally poking our heads out. And I find that very, very comforting and nice. Um, in the pandemic, I really, I discovered a lot more of necessity um, how to create more community online. So I was part of a silent Zoom writing group for quite a long time where everyone just logged on at the same time and then we turned our video and our sound off, but we just knew each other were there. And that was during the time when I couldn't go to the writer's room. So that was kind of an analogue. In terms of fiction and theatre, I just really feel at a watershed with theatre. I don't know what kind of play I want to write next. And the American theatre is in a lot of turmoil and soul-searching you know, and one of the things that's really come to me is to think, what is my place in the American theatre, which is so much about American stories and American voices. And 
I just feel like I'm done with dancing backwards in high heels, trying to pass in that way, you know. It isn't really my voice. And so for me, fiction has offered a place to find a voice that is less about what I need to do in community with other people to make a piece of work, you know. So I'm really in transition there. And, you know, one of the things that I heard, Colin, in what you were saying is, how much you've also been in transition. It's not just the pandemic and having the space to go back to, but being in life transition as well. And, you know, how all those, those I think community really changes. Um, I'm loving the course I'm doing at the moment, the online writing course, and that feels like a real community. And I also have a place that I really, really love that I go to when I can, which is the Virginia Centre for the Creative Arts. And I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend applying to that if you want to go somewhere that's lovely and a lot of the same people go back to they take 50 percent returning fellows and 50 percent new people every time so you do tend to see friends there and I love that um, I should also mention that they have fellowships for veterans they have a special focus on supporting veteran writers too so Colin if you don't already know about them bookmark uh, I'm trying to go COVID yeah. Uh, the kibosh on it. <laughs> yeah. open, so you never know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I totally recommend it. And that feels like a really great community. Also, they have a lot of visual artists that go there and composers. And, you know, so that cross art form conversation happens really a lot. And I find that really inspiring and great because musicians and painters think really differently than writers. That they do. And how about you, Judith? Um, do you, um, how do you define community? What does it mean to you? It's always something that's elusive for me. I um, love the idea of community or I've always loved the idea of having like a group of friends, but I never do. I mean, you know, it's always sort of individual one-on-one -on -one kinds of things. I love the idea of people, you know, organizing to do something, but then I won't show up. So. I, you know, Christine, your, your image of all of us sort of scuttling in and out of our shells, that's just it. I mean, maybe that's my idea of community. I don't know, being able to be an extreme introvert, you know, in the presence of other people who don't mind, you know, mm -hmm. and where I don't have to apologize for myself and it's okay. Um, you know, it's, again, I think, and often with writers, I just feel very supported at the, at the writer's room. I feel like it's warm. I feel like people are genuinely celebrating one another's progress, successes, whatever, you know? And if there are challenges, always up for commiserating, let's say. And that's really nice. And I think that's pretty rare, frankly, because, you know, there are a lot of situations where you get a group of writers together if they do similar things. And it's, and it's competitive. I, I didn't realize I think um, that it would be, you know, when I started kind of writing in the area I was writing in, let's say for Perfect Madness, you know, I was entering this universe of other, other women who did similar kinds of work. And I thought like, I would join this sisterhood. And it, you know, it, it's not actually like that, you know, most of the time, but at the writer's room, it, it has been this feeling of um, sort of there's room for everybody and everyone's, one person's success, you almost feel ownership of it because we're there together. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that really answers the question, but it's probably the closest thing to community that I have experienced. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think it does because I it, it varies for everybody. You know, there are some people who really want to have, um, you know, people they can go to events with or somebody to, you know, like read your work. And, you know, for others, it's just knowing that there's somebody else who is sharing mm -hmm. in and doing the same thing that, you know, you're doing. So I, I, I like the idea and I, you know, just love hearing the various perspectives on what community means. Um, so is there any advice you would give um, to anybody who is looking for a community beyond, you know, stepping back from what it, what it means for you what advice would you give to um, another writer who is looking for a community? What would you, it's just one piece of advice. Um, I think um, to 
listen to your own heart about what you need and then to go out and look for that. Because DC is, you know, it's a big city and there's the Writers' Centre at Bethesda. In better times when it's not the pandemic, there's many, many places where there's readings, um, there's online writing groups, there's courses. So I think it just comes down to what do you really need to find and then go out and look because it's probably there. Mm. Yeah. And I would say let yourself be um, vulnerable and let, let people see what you're actually experiencing in terms of the difficulties of writing be, rather than having to put up a facade of, you know, everything's great, you know, and it's just one success after the other because that's not what it's like for people. And, you know, the, the, one of the nicest parts of that community for me is that people, you know, look and, and exchange looks of kind of, Whew, yeah, it's hard today, you know, and, and we're all in it together and it'll be better tomorrow. I mean, that's the kind of thing, you know, the kind of response people will give you too is like, uh, I know what you mean, but you know, you, you'll get, the, you know, it, it sort of, um, and that's a really nice thing. And I think, especially when you're younger, I think, and, and starting off, there tends to be this feeling that everyone else knows what they're doing, right? And they're on this upward slope and that it's a linear pattern and, and you have to sort of fake it till you make it, put on a good face. And, um, and with, with, with age and over time, you realize that it isn't like that for anyone. And including, you know, the people who seem the most successful, they are still struggling with the same yeah. self-doubt and insecurities, you know, that, that you are when you're starting. Um, and I think the way to be able to access that sort of deeper sense of community of, of like our common humanity in, in writing is by actually giving people access to it in you. So I would say like drop the hard shell. Oh, lovely. That's great. And how about you, Colin? Do you have any words of advice? Um, yeah, I mean, I uh, truth and Christine both said was, was um, I, I would like to have said too, but yeah, I, I would start with, the, with what Christine said was find what you need. Because I, I do think with writing that can be super subjective. Um, I mean, for a while when I moved to DC, I was I'd done some stand up before, and I was thinking about getting into. I did get into stand up and was trying to figure out like, is is stand up going to be my thing? And um, there are lots of different types and introverts in stand up too. But it, it's very social. You have to be. You, you kind of have to. You have to be. If you if you're not out there getting in front of crowds on a regular basis and making connections, like you're not gonna not gonna make it in stand up. And then writing is very very different. You, you can be very social. You you could be the complete opposite. You do have to get the writing done. So I think in terms of what what do you need to get the writing done? For some people, it's it's one thing. For for other people, it's um, another. And so I do think that advice to find what you need is, is, is very valuable. And that whatever level of community you need to continue to be motivated. Because it is, um, yeah, it, is, it can be lonely and isolating, especially as you know, I'm in my 30s. I think the 20s kind of riding the wave of uh, coming from college and, and um, the goodwill of just my friends sending them my work. And it is helpful to have friends at that age who are just like, you're good, this is good, um, to just make you keep doing it. Uh, but that changes over time. So over time, finding maybe more deeper, mature connections is helpful too, which is what the writer's room has given me. Oh, lovely, good to hear that. So as we, um, I, I guess, just wrap up here, what I would love to hear from you is what you're working on next. Um, if you want to give us a little description or a snippet of it. Um, so I start with you, Judith. I am, not, well, okay, immediate next, I have an overdue paper for the Reflective Democracy campaign um, talking about the, you know, the effects of the, you know, insane conditions of 2020. Mm -hmm. on the, you know, how groups that were working to bring us more reflective candidates, how they fared and what happened, you know, how the progress they were making actually turned out 
any year that was so challenging and, and unusual. But beyond that, I do have a, a new book idea that I want to get on paper as a, a you know a fleshed out proposal, which is basically about what happens when when life shatters and you don't know who you are anymore, where you've landed, and your life seems unreal to you. Um, and how do you get? How do you? What happens next? You know? How do you get up pieces? Yeah. Um, I also, my husband and I, are trying to figure out a way to write very commercial fiction so that we can make some money. Um, and uh, I'm trying to convince him that if we really lower the stakes, like if we really, really lower our expectations, um, <laughs> that maybe, you know, we can actually do something that will get done and not be intimidated by the process because, you know, of trying to do it because we, we are so intimidated by the idea of writing fiction, which has always been the mm -hmm. holy grail for both of us. Um, so I, you know, I've been trying to convince him that we could write under pseudonym together and um, I really, we're about to go to France. So just really like dive into every cliche that Americans have about life in France and French people and because, and try to sell that. That's horribly cynical, but I, I here's the other thing that any professional writer will know. All anybody really talks about with their friends if they're writers is money, so. Um, you know, I mean, it's a bit of an overstatement, but um, that is something that has been really nice, actually, in getting to know more professional writers is just, it, it de-romanticizes it, you know? And it's nuts and bolts stuff, just like any other kind of work. Yeah, indeed, that is so true. Um, and Christine, what are you working on? Um, well, you did talk about your speculative fiction, is that? Yeah, I think I'll be I'll be in the trenches with that for quite a long time, and um, I'm really having fun finding out about plastic and about um, the interface between biological life forms and drones, and uh, so I, I'm kind of puddling around in that world at the moment, and I'm also working on a libretto with an Australian composer, long distance collaboration. Oh. That'll keep that'll keep me out of trouble for quite a long time. Both of those things, I think, um, oh, and going back to my job, job. So yeah, right, lovely. And Colin, we know you're finishing up your novel. Yeah, trying to finish this up. I, I finished a draft of two or three months ago, and I um, just sent it to uh, some writer friends, and then I, the next step will be to send it to this agent so my first time dealing with all of that he had reached out to me and pushed me to write the novel so um I guess that is helpful that he's he's waiting to read it and I don't have to like beg someone to read it but uh so yeah I put in the work with that and um continuing to try to keep it alive, I guess, because sometimes you work on something so much that you can't really see it anymore. So I'm kind of taking a break this week and then might revisit it next week. And then, I don't know, I might, there's a story that I, I wrote in, uh, in my MFA that's kind of stuck with me that I think half words. And it was kind of based on a story that my military friend told me. He was a combat veteran and he was on leave in Las Vegas and they ran into Richard Simmons and they like hung out with Richard Simmons and I was trying to fictionalize that. And it's something I'd like to revisit. I think there's something there um, that I'd like to revisit and, and that fiction especially can, can maybe find something um, kind of truthful and interesting. So yeah, that's what's going on with me. Okay, lovely. I'm, I'm just so intrigued by, you know, like all these various types of stories and writing and just where you are. <laughs> taking everything. So, um, you know, certainly thank you for spending this time and talking to us about, you know, what it, what it means to you to make space to write. Um, so good luck to all of you and thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much for bringing thank us you. together, Donna, and for having the most wonderful place to write in DC. Thank you. <laughs>